Well, hi there, and welcome to our Revelation Bible study. We're already on chapter 15, and it's a shorter chapter this time, but there's a lot of information in here. But before we do, let's open with a word of prayer. God, we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for who you are. And in our difficult circumstances, God, and there's a lot of people, Lord, on, on the Lighthouse Discord server who've gone through some really difficult challenges lately and are going through them. <clears throat> and we think of our one friend, Lord, who's just lost his pastor. God, when we know you, we have that hope and future of spending eternity with you. We know that you'll be with us. You know that you're, we know that you're faithful and loving, and we know that you teach us the truth but it doesn't make it any easier for the family and friends of those left behind. And so, Father, I pray for our young friend today. I pray, Lord God, for him and for his family and for the pastor's family, Lord, that they would be encouraged that they would be strengthened and comforted in their time of grieving. And I pray, Lord God, that you would meet every need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, if there's anything any of us can do, would you give us wisdom and discernment for that? And for every other need on the server, Lord, for the one young man who is continually being bullied and verbally abused, Lord, and emotionally abused, this is not okay. God, we are in need of you, all of us. And so I give you the server and I give you each one on the server today and I ask God that your will would be done. Lead us, guide us. And as we draw closer to the time when Jesus returns, life is getting more difficult. You never said it would be a bed of roses. But what you did say is that you will never leave us or forsake us. And so we know that the war is not against each other. It's not against people. It's against principalities and power. It's talked about in Ephesians chapter 6. But we also know, Lord, that you love us so much, that you gave your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And so we place our hope in you tonight. And we ask God that your will would be done. Now open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to receive the words you have for us out of Revelation chapter 15. And we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for your word. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Revelation 15, reading from the New American Standard. A scene of heaven. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. 
And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and with and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So this is a very short chapter, as I mentioned. And in reality, according to Damon R. Duck, the author of the book of Revelation, the Smart Guide to the Bible series that we're studying, chapter 15 is what most scholars believe should be combined with chapter 16 because what it is is an introduction to the seven bold judgments found in chapter 16. And it predicts what will go on in heaven just before the final judgments fall. Interesting. So verse 1, reading from the New King James, which is what our book uses. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Now, before we get into the wrath of God, I want to make something abundantly clear. We have been studying a book called Astounding Love, written by John Hutchinson who is a pastor that I knew, and actually one who ordained me, along with another pastor, John, that I knew, on behalf of my bishop some years ago. Now, he's passed away now, but God revealed to him the agape love that he has for all of us. And I want to raise this so that we understand that even when God's wrath comes, he still loves us. But he is a righteous and just God, and he will not tolerate sin forever. He can't. Because God and sin don't jive. So we need to understand, friends, that at some point, God's anger, his wrath, will come down. And this is where we stand. Damon tells us, this will be the third of three great signs in heaven. So first, the sun-clothed woman, that's Israel. Second, the great red dragon, who's Satan. And now we have seven angels with seven last plagues. Now, this sign will be great and marvelous because of its terrible nature and amazing result. Because it's going to bring on the full wrath of God, which will cause the fall of Satan and his devilish crew. See, these plagues can be called last plagues because they will be God's final warnings to an unrepentant world. And when these plagues are over, all of those who have not made a decision to side with God through Jesus will stand before the judgment of unbelievers and perish. Do you see why it's so important, friends, that we share the gospel message with all of those around us? We're not all going to be evangelists. We're not all going to be pastors or preachers. But we do need to share the word with those around us. Whether it be in word or in deed, like how we live our lives, how we treat other people, sharing our own life story, it's important. Okay, verse 2. 
And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now, Damon tells us that this will be the second glassy sea to appear in heaven. The first one will be clear as crystal. We heard about that in Revelation 4, 6. This one will be mixed with fire. And the sea in Revelation 17, 15 symbolizes the masses of humanity and the fire represents judgment. Now, can you even imagine what a glassy sea would look like? I have not done this, but now when I go back into Minecraft next, <coughs> excuse me, I think I might just try it. I'm wondering what it would be like to put fire, then a couple blocks up, put glass, couple more blocks up, cover it, but in the layer above the fire, what if I fill that with water? I wonder how that would work. I'm going to try it. Because to me, that would be a way of picturing what the clear glass, this clear crystal water or sea would be with fire mixed in it. I'm interested. You see, Damon tells us that the tribulation saints will come up out of the sea of humanity and they will have been in a fiery persecution. They are those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and over the number of his name. Understand, these are the people who basically accept Christ after tribulation has begun. Okay? And they're not going to be deceived by the Antichrist or his false prophet. They will be tracked down and they will be ordered to take the mark of the beast, but they will refuse. And for their refusal, they are going to face retaliation in the form of torture and death. Are we ready for that? See, those of us who know Jesus today won't have to face this. But this is going to be those who decide to wait until tribulation to accept Christ. I don't want to wait. <laughs> Trust me, I do not want to wait. The choice is yours. Would you be able to be tortured and face death? I don't know. But we need to understand that victory, it talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57, will still be there because they will lose their earthly life, but they will gain an eternal one. Philippians 1, 21. And when they reach heaven, God will give them harps. I love that. And their earthly trials will have caused a lot of crying. But when they get to heaven, they will sing and play. Robert H. Mounts wrote this. <coughs> Sorry, guys. These who stand on the crystal pavement are those who have emerged victorious. They have not abandoned their faith nor succumbed to the threats of Antichrist. They are the overcorners to whom the seven letters hold out promise of eating of the tree of life. In chapter 2, verse 7. Protection from the second death. Chapter 2, verse 11. Hidden manna. Chapter 2, verse 17. Authority over the nations. Chapter 2, verse 26. White garments. Chapter 3, verse 5. The honor of becoming a pillar in the temple of God. Chapter 3, verse 12. 
and the privilege of sitting with Christ on his throne, chapter 3, verse 21. Little wonder that they break out in song. Hal Lindsey wrote this. Real victory is not found in seeking to avoid conflicts and living a don't rock the boat kind of life. The cemetery is full of people who fit that category. The kind of triumph these martyrs of the tribulation will experience will be deliverance through fire, not out of it. Think about that for a moment. Deliverance through the fire, not out of it. We have people looking for deliverance. We have people seeking God. We have people wanting life to be perfect. And yet here is a group of people who will be delivered through the fire. Through it. What do we want? Do we want an easy life or do we want Jesus? Everybody's different. I'm not here to judge and I'm not judging. Explore your thoughts. Go to Psalm 139 that I shared last night in our Bible study and look at the last two, three verses. Search me, O oh God. Search my heart. I think we all could do a little of that. Verse 3. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. You see, the tribulation saints are going to sing two songs. The first is the song of Moses, and the second is the song of the Lamb. And the song of Moses is found in the Old Testament in Exodus 15, verses 1 through 19. And it celebrates the victory that God gave Israel when he brought her out of Egypt. Pharaoh's army chased after the Hebrews to recapture them, but his troops were drowned in the Red Sea. And we just read the Song of the Lamb, which celebrates God's reign and victory over all the nations. The deeds of Jesus are great and marvelous because he died for the sins of the world and will defeat Satan. And isn't it interesting that there's a whole faction of people out there who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Or if they do believe he's the Son of God, they don't believe he's divine. They don't believe that he's God, that he's actually part of the Trinity or the triune God. How could he have the power to defeat Satan? if he was not part of the Godhead. You see, the ways of Jesus are just and true. He's never unjust and he's never untruthful and his judgments are righteous. His words are accurate and reliable. Jesus is the king of the ages. He is the eternal king. The one who has reigned is reigning and always will reign. J.R. Church wrote this. Just prior to the seven vile judgments, vile meaning V-I-A-L, the saints in heaven will sing the song of Moses. They await the victory. Soon Satan will be bound and the messianic kingdom will be established. Messianic. Messiah. Jesus. Verse 4. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. 
for your judgments have been manifested. Damon's absolutely right when he says this. Listen to his words here. Today, few people speak of having a reverential fear of the Lord or of giving glory to him. Friends, do you not agree? Do we revere the Lord? We don't have to be afraid of him, terrified of him, but we need to view him with awe. You see, we seem to think in our society today that there is something wrong with giving glory to God and there's something wrong with giving him reverence. But you see, there's, these are of the utmost importance now and in heaven for what Damon says, these three reasons. One, Jesus should be feared and glorified because he alone is holy. He is the only one to live by all of God's standards. The only one worthy of our worship. The only one who never sinned. He has been hallowed or set apart for God's special purpose. An atonement for our sin. And yet we take that so lightly. Think about it. Think about the sin we engage in. Think about our walk with God and how lackadaisical we are. Apathetic. Oh me, oh my, I sinned. Oh me, oh my, I'm going through a hard time. We forget or don't get that God sent his son, Jesus, to atone for our sin, friends. This is nothing to play around in. It's serious business. He died for you and for me and for our sin. Two, Jesus should be feared and glorified because he will be worshipped by all nations. The day is going to come when he will deal with the godless leaders of this world. And quite frankly, he will do away with them. And every nation will worship him. Every nation, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Three, Jesus should be feared and glorified because his righteous acts will be revealed. The terrible judgments of the tribulation period will be righteous acts of Jesus. He is going to deal with those who do not accept his mercy. He has to, because he's righteous. Peter and Paul Lalonde wrote this. According to opinion polls, an overwhelming majority of North Americans believe they will spend eternity in heaven. About 93 to 95%. Yet it's obvious from the moral decay and decadence in the West that such a majority does not have the love of Christ in their hearts. Just how do we think we're going to get to heaven if we don't understand the love of Christ and we have not accepted or received him as our Lord and Savior. I would say it's impossible. 
And oh, I know I'm coming down hard, guys. I know it. But we need to understand at some point the Lighthouse Discord server and the people on it. And at some point, every one of us is going to have to face up to this. So popular opinion poll or not, I have to preach the word of God. I have to share with you the truth of scripture. If you think I'm perfect, by far I am not. But I have to. I have to share this. Verse 5. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Damon tells us a temple in heaven will be opened. Then the Holy of Holies inside the temple will be opened, followed by the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant contains the Ten Commandments that we have can read in Exodus 20, verses 2 to 17. And those are sometimes called the Law or the Testimony. Now, those who reject the grace and mercy God offers through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus, will be judged under the law, which is the Ten Commandments. And in rejecting what God offers, they also reject Jesus. And sadly, including the Jewish people, and I have a Jewish friend, by the way, an online friend. They don't realize this important point because by rejecting Jesus, they reject God and leave themselves open to be judged under the law of Moses in the Old Testament. And the law of Moses was given to reveal sin, not to take it away. It was to reveal sin, not to remove it. Sin can only be taken away by the Lamb of God who is Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way. Humanly, we cannot possibly keep the law. We may try, but we can't keep it. Verse 6. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. So seven angels are going to come out of the temple, and they will be dressed in pure bright linen, signifying their righteousness. And they're going to wear golden bands around their chests, signifying their royal priesthood. Damon tells us that these seven angels will move away from the temple and the mercy seat, which is the gold lid on the Ark of the Covenant. And they are royal and powerful priests preparing to pour out the wrath of God. Those on earth will receive judgment without mercy. Because they have flouted God. They have followed the Antichrist. They've taken the mark. They worshipped his image. And they've rejected Jesus. And because of that, they will face the full fury of God. Hebrews 10, 31. Verse 7. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So Damon writes, one of the four living creatures will hand the seven angels seven bowls filled with the wrath of God. Now some Bible translations call these bowls vials, V-I-A-L-S, but that does not do justice to the meaning of this verse. Because when a vial is turned upside down, the liquid bubbles out slowly. But when a bowl is upset, the liquid is suddenly dumped out. And that 
is the picture that we have here. God's wrath will suddenly be dumped out on the inhabitants of the earth. Now in the Old Testament, once a year on the Day of Atonement, talked about in Leviticus 16 verses 14 to 15, the high priest would take a bowl of blood from a sacrificial animal into the Holy of Holies and dump it on the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant. God had him do that to offer atonement for the sins of the people. Since the Antichrist and his followers will not accept the blood of Jesus as an atonement for their sins, these priestly angels will be given golden bowls, or sorry, given bowls filled with God's wrath instead of the blood of Jesus. And instead of dumping the bowls on the mercy seat, they will dump them on the earth. First, the four living creatures, talked about in Revelation 6, verses 1 to 8, summon the four horsemen. Now the four living creatures summon the seven angels of God's wrath. Jim Combs wrote, Man never gets away with sin and rebellion. In the final stages of the tribulation, these seven last plagues are poured out on a Christ-rejecting world, run amok after Satan and the false religious worship that focuses on the image of the beast. Verse 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. If you want to know more about smoke, look up Isaiah 6, verse 4. David summarizes, things just keep getting worse for those who reject God. When the priestly angels leave the temple, it will be filled with smoke from the glory and power of God. No one is going to be able to go back in or enter, enter the Holy of Holies. No one can change their mind and pour blood on the mercy seat. There will be no more mercy, no more delays, and no more opportunities to repent until the seven plagues have passed. This is a warning to those on earth who won't listen to the pleas of God made through his messengers, the 144,000 Jewish people, the two witnesses, the angel, and others. At some point in the tribulation period, God will say it's over. And the destiny of those who keep rejecting my son is sealed forever. God will pour out his wrath, keep people away from the mercy seat, and refuse to hear the pleas of those crying out for one more chance. Lord God, you gave 120 years for the world to repent before the flood. You have given us chance after chance after chance to repent and turn to you. Oh God, that we would take that to heart, that we would realize how critical it is that we turn our lives to you. Because without that hope and future, we're destined to eternity in hell. And that, quite frankly, ought to terrify every single person in this world. God, I pray that you would make yourself real to us. I pray, Lord God, that you would draw us so close to you that we would know beyond any shadow of a doubt how much you love us and care for us. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for being present with us today. Help us to learn more from you and help us to grow in our relationship with you. 
We thank you and we praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.